welcome and thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Afshar, Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce and your co-host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send Dion, myself, and our distinguished guests your questions live using hashtag Disrupt TV, and we will do our best to answer them. Today, it's my privilege to introduce Dion Hinchcliffe. He's an expert in information technology, business strategy, and next generation enterprise. Dion is currently Vice President and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research, as well as Chief Strategy Officer at Seven Summits. He's a sought after keynote speaker, co-author of several best-selling books, including Web 2.0 Architectures in Social Business by Design. I highly recommend that you read all of his ZDNet articles. He's one of my favorite thought leaders to follow and a must follow on Twitter at D-H-I-N-C-H-C-L-I-F-F-E. Welcome to Disrupt TV, Dion Hinchcliffe. Well, thanks, Vala. That was a rousing introduction. Uh, we're looking forward to the show today. Excellent. Well, it's our uh, privilege and honor to have Dr. Anushka Anand, Senior Product Manager at Tableau, where she's leading the team's effort in augmented data management. Dr. Anand works to help customers understand data quality issues, clean and integrate data with the use of machine learning and other methods. Dr. Anand was a member of Tableau's research team from 2012 to 2017, working on visualization recommendations with projects such as Voyager and Auto Partitioner. Dr. Nan led the creation of recommendation engine team that helped build the machine learning based recommendation features within Tableau. She serves on the program committee of the board of trustees of the Anita Borg Institute for Women in Technology and helped found the Fremont Women in Technology Group. You can follow Dr. Anand on Twitter at A-N-U-S-H-K-A underscore A-N-A-N-D 22. Welcome Dr. Anand to Disrupt TV. Thank you, Ala. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. I know I got into Twitter late, so apologize. <laughs> yeah. It's never too late. It's never too late. <laughs> uh, never too late. Yeah, so, so Dr. Anand, you, you've been doing some great things uh, with machine learning and, and Tableau. Um, I was wondering if you could just spend a, a minute or two telling us about what's your background and involvement in artificial intelligence and what specifically drew you to study and work with artificial intelligence? Sure. Um, so um, what drew me into AI and ML like over a decade ago was really um, the opportunity, the diversity of opportunity that uh, AI was offering in terms of problems you could solve. So my PhD research was in the intersection of machine learning and data visualization, where I was looking at how do you take large data sets with hundreds or thousands of variables and help people understand relationships between those variables. So you can think of um, DNA microarray data and cancer expression or census data and life expectancy. So my work was looking into building a classifier that could help users identify subsets of this data that maximized separation which is important when you're trying to build a sort of decision boundary that separates different categories of data. And then my work extended to find subsets of data that were visually interesting. So think of like finding clusters or trends in data, which are interesting starting points for analysts to explore further. And as so, well, and these are, these are real strengths of your, of your platform. So first you worked on coming up with ways to make the data really crisp. And then once you had that data, uh, you were able to then visualize that, use visualization tools to actually gain insight from it. To help users understand, especially when you've got like really large data, it's hard to look at that data. So you have to find the subsets that are visually interesting, sort of like slicing, think of like, high dimensional space and you're looking for a slice in that that highlights something interesting and then you can understand relationships between variables. So that was sort of the PhD work and then I joined Tableau Research to apply some of those ideas into real world products around like recommending ways in which analysts can get started exploring data. The thing with data is that when you when you have a data set there's a huge array of charts that you you can produce. So recommendations essentially do the heavy lifting. They prune, so what we did was prune the set of visualizations based on 
sort of applying best practices on from perception research and then ranking those based on uh, various criteria so that analysts knew what to focus on. Um, and so really it's applying machine learning to help an analyst rather than replace them. Hmm. That's sort of the principle of my work. It's so awesome to speak to someone who's been on this journey for 10 years. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's it's uh, uh, to be able to talk about machine learning and classifiers and working in this space, which is so new to so many of us, and yet you've been in this in this space for ten years. So, what are some of the opportunities in terms of machine learning and AI in terms of transforming the analytics space? Well, it's kind of trite, but the m number one thing that's hard about data analytics is data cleaning. Um, I think the often quoted statistic is that analysts or data scientists spend 80% of their time preparing data and only 20% of their time actually analyzing it. So I think the number one opportunity here for machine learning is to make it easier to clean and prepare data so then you can do more machine learning or more analysis. Um, and it's not just a big opportunity in the sense that the impact is large, it also is an opportunity to grow the story that machine learning isn't going to replace the whole task. It's really gonna be well integrated into the analyst's job where it's how they interact with data when they're cleaning it to analyzing it. If I look at just the cleaning space, um, there's a huge opportunity for machine learning to help with data standardization. It's one of these error prone, tedious tasks. And like human entered data is a great example of really messy data that you need to spend a lot of time cleaning up. I mean, I think if I asked you both to spell Albuquerque, it would be some interesting results. <laughs> you get at least two different answers, yes. Yeah, yeah. You definitely would get two different answers and mine would be wrong. <laughs> yeah. I know, right? it's, it's just like tricky. We're so used to having things autocorrect things, but when you're filling out forms and you, you, you end up looking at data, you see all of this variation. And it's really important for analysis that you reconcile data so that you can correctly answer questions like, how many customers are from Albuquerque? Right. Yeah, well, so, well, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, garbage in, garbage out problem, I suspect. So uh, you, know, you talked about data prep, and that's been one of the, the, the big topics. But you know, as artificial intelligence and machine learning has really been a, you know, a top trend for the last three years, uh, and you've been doing it for so long, maybe you could highlight some of the challenges in building products that actually leverage AI. What, what are the real challenges here? Um, one of the biggest this challenge is data, is getting enough data. So machine learning algorithms, particularly in production, do well when they have a lot of data that they're trained on. So if you think of, and it's, it's not just data, it's labeled data. So if you think of use cases that are now sort of normal to us, like spam detection, fraud detection, image classification, those are built and tuned on a lot of data. and. Um, getting the data helps machine learning algorithms generalize so that you can make predictions that are good on new unseen um, examples. So the, the danger when you sort of have limited data is that you end up overfitting your solution and building the solution for a subset of your customers. Um, and this is particularly challenging when you're building products in the B2B space because enterprises have far stricter policies around data sharing and privacy. So you can't quite get the data from them or experiment with different versions of a solution. Um, the other big challenge is that sometimes machine learning algorithms are black boxes. And when you're building products, especially smart products or automated products, being able to explain why a thing is recommended or a thing is suggested or something happens automatically is really important when you're building trust with customers using a system. We found this out through a lot of customer testing when I built out features for recommendations where we would sort of in the server product recommend relevant data sources for you. But the number one thing people wondered is why am I seeing this? Can I trust this? Should I worry about this? It's, it's kind of why for like Netflix, you have sort of categories that try to explain why things are suggested for you. So I think explainability is 
one of the challenges, and I know there's a lot of research currently with deep learning methods that are particularly hard to explain, to try to make it so that you can look under the hood and understand what's happening with an algorithm like that. Although, you know, so trust is a real issue with a lot of these, uh, uh, mm -hmm. these algorithms. So, um, but you know, a, a positive feedback loop can really help too, can't it? I mean, if you, you can learn to trust the results because you know that if you use the data, you, it, it, it seems to be right, right? So I mean, just yeah, interesting yeah. how that how Totally, we I mean, need sorry, early adopters to like uh, start using it. And then yes, it both like builds trust in the product and it gives the product some data to learn from and improve. So it's mutually beneficial. I, I was at an event with Dr. Kai-Fu Lee who authored uh, AI Superpowers and um, he talked about in the process of trying to understand the recommendations, if you try to simplify the algorithms or, or, or build in explainability logic, you, you could potentially erode the full potential of, 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 the, of the algorithm and AI capability. So is, do you subscribe to that? That, that you know, even though trust is key and you need to be able to explain, if you uh, if if you try to build that into the into the logic, you may not reach the full full potential of AI. Uh, I think it depends on the task, like what is the problem you're solving, and I think it's important on the product and how important it is, particularly for business critical products where we are recommending a decision in this world of, you know, helping people make data driven decisions it is really important that they be able to lean back and understand why, like what factors are causing this. So in that case, it's always a trade-off that you have to make, whether I pick um, explainability versus just accuracy. And in, in some cases you'd favor um, more interpretability. I mean, it's also like now it's the law for uh, any automated system, any automated decision-making system in Europe, like you have to be able, is it is a person's right to get an explanation for why those things are being recommended. And I think that's really important, not just because it helps you understand and trust the system, but because it sometimes highlights assumptions that the system is making that may not be right. Sure, sure, makes sense. So you're actively involved in women in technology initiatives. <clears throat> Why do you think it's important to bring women in creating these, these type of technologies? Uh, and, and this has been you know, a long standing issue uh, in our industry is you know, the, getting the, the supply side, uh, you know, uh, women on the technology side with the demand side. How do we get to the next level? Um, I'm going to answer the why it's important first because yeah, it's, like, it's been repeated a bunch of times, but when we're building products that are for all people or trying to solve problems for all people. We really need to include all the people in that process. And it's not just about like understanding their use cases or pain points. It's about actually designing something that will be deployed and used by all the people. Um, and so that's one piece of the problem. The other part of why I think we need more women or just diversity in the groups that are building, creating technology is that it's a huge opportunity machine learning engineers, engineers, data scientists are some of the most lucrative jobs. They are the most in-demand jobs. And from a recent Market Watch report, they're also some of the jobs with the highest job satisfaction rating. Um, and I think the reason for that is that there is a huge diversity of opportunities. Like you could be working to solve problems in the clean energy space or home automation, like the opportunity space is huge, which makes it fun to be in this a space creating um, the next, next set of products. The counterpoint to that is that women are mostly the, um, in jobs that are at risk of being displaced by automation, ML, AI, a recent McKinsey report pointed that out. And so I feel like there's a uh, sort of re more urgency to kind of retrain and get them in on helping shape that transformation. Um, and how can we get to the next level? Um, besides to like the top of the funnel in this pipeline, I think there's a lot of effort around getting more people studying and getting into computer science and uh, fields like that. I think the other bit is that uh, the, 
the funnel sort of tapers off really quickly as you look at companies in terms of opportunities of advancing women. So more of growing the potential up top for women in leadership would sort of inspire more women to see that, look, there are women at the top helping shape, build companies, products, new initiatives in government and so on. So it's just, um, I think seeing more role models has a surprising impact. I mean, it is why most men got into computer science. They saw their dad or other people tinker with um, computers and got into it. So we kind of need to put more women up in front of the next generation to inspire them. Absolutely. That's I, I agree with you totally. And I also think it's important for companies to understand the importance of sponsorship. It's great to have a mentor, someone that can teach you and coach you in terms of how you can refine your skills and learn new skills, but having a sponsor, someone who is higher in the organization and willing to put their social capital on the line to promote your work and your career growth, I think is critically important. So sponsorship is really important. Um, Dr. Anand, take us into the future. Uh, you've been in this space long before anybody else. So. If I'm in marketing, I'm in sales, I'm in customer service, I'm, I'm in business, regardless of which line, what does the world of business look like five years from now with advancements uh, like ML? The world of business. So first, let me say I'm not in the space as long as some of the other people you will have on uh, later in the show. But um, in terms of business, I think I think if you think of how people um, experience AI in your daily lives today, it's largely through experiences put out by some of the largest tech companies, right? Like Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, so on. But I think in the next like five, 10 years, we'll be able to get way more AI personalization. So like the takeout, the, the restaurant down the street that you get takeout from or the store down the block where you buy your set of jeans, they'll be able to tap into your sort of customer profile, your history and give you way more sort of targeted experiences, targeted marketing. Um, and I think that is partially driven because of how machine learning has sort of changed our expectations as a customer. Um, our expectations around consumption, whether it's news or media, is completely different. We expect recommendations, we expect guidance, we expect personalization, and I think that will permeate a lot more experiences. It'll sort of be expected from these businesses. Totally agree. Oh. <laughs> It'll be an interesting time. Maybe. I, do th I do think speed, personalization, and intelligence are the new currencies in this hyper-connected knowledge sharing economy. So whether it's Spotify, Netflix, Amazon, all these big companies, like you mentioned, that really over time get to know you more and therefore the engagement feels super personalized at scale. Um, we'll see that democratized to medium and small size businesses. And also I think that's the expectation of the consumer and business buyer. I want the company to know me. Exactly. Because, exactly. You know, time is very precious. So, you know, if you can give me back some time because you know my, or you can anticipate my needs, then that, that's a beautiful thing. That, that is a beautiful future. <laughs> you know, there's so much choice. So if you help me, that, okay. that's, yeah. All right, so, so uh, to round out our, um, uh, our discussion here, uh, you know, transformation is the hottest topic of the day, whether that's business transformation or digital transformation, you know, change uh, is in the air. And, and AI has got to be involved in that. If you were going to dream about a transformation being enabled by these artificial intelligence technologies, what would that be? Um, I think, um, I think the ability to understand language, any language. And so what I mean is accurate machine translation at my fingertips. So imagine you had your own personal babble fish. So you could really understand anyone, anytime. That would be something really cool. Um, I think it's partially, particularly relevant to me because I'm uh, going to leave my kid at a daycare that is a Spanish immersion school and I know no Spanish and I was like, man, if only we were at the state of art where machine learning enabled machine translation to be easily accessible, it would be a great future, but 
think that's still a few years out. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Anand, for joining us. Thank uh, you. It was a pleasure and we learned a ton. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Yeah, thank, thank you. Dion, absolutely. I wish I started, you know, researching and learning about ML 10 years ago. I know you probably did, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's certainly uh, an area of- Well, that's what's old is new again, but now it's just so advanced. You, you know, you, you better have gotten your data science and math chops to get into this, when you were young, to get into this world. It's- uh, Absolutely, it's absolutely. And, and a data science pioneer is our next guest. We have Dr. Sho Limon, uh, the Whipple and B. Jones Professor of Statistics and founding editor-in-chief of Harvard Data Science Review as our next, next guest. Uh, Dr. Wan is well known for his depth and breadth in research, his innovation and passion in pedagogy, his vision and effectiveness in administration, as well as his engaging and entertaining style as a speaker and writer. I saw a video of you talking about stats and long-lasting marriage, and it's a must-watch. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Mon was named the best statistician under age of 40 by COPSS, Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies. He's the recipient of numerous awards and honors for more than 150 publications in at least a dozen theoretical and methodological areas, as well as areas of pedagogy and professional development. He has delivered more than 400 research presentations and public speeches on these topics, and he's the author of the Excel Files, a thought-provoking and entertaining column in the IMS Institute of Mathematical Statistics Bulletin. You can uh, fo uh, follow Dr. Mon on Twitter at X-I-A-O-L-I-M-E-N-G-1. Welcome, uh, Dr. Mon, to the Shroff TV. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, thank you for that great introduction. Appreciate it. I, I had to shorten your bio because we only have 20 minutes and you've done a lot. So <laughs> about the abbreviated version. <laughs> so, uh, so Dr. Mun, uh, uh, walk us through some of the, the, the things you've been working on recently in terms of producing governmental data. Uh, you use this, this, uh, this provocative term, an intellectually, the second intellectually violent revolution in developing uh, official statistics. Um, and how that leads into something you call differential privacy. Can I kind of paint the picture of what, what, what's happening there? Sure. Let me first explain what is the first sort of intellectually yeah. violent okay. revolution. This was, uh, I think it was like 1895 and was uh, the founder of Norwegian statistics. Uh, his name is Anders Kaya or Kia, I can never pronounce correctly a, a Norwegian name. He at that time proposed the idea that you can learn a whole country by taking a sample. And, uh, you know, we have taken that for granted now. I mean, any elections, any opinions, you know, you take what? 400 people, maybe 4,000 people, you never take even a few hundred thousand people, right? And you're trying to learn, you know, a state, a country, and uh, that become a sort of backbone of social, uh, you know, science research. We all have taken this for granted. But you can imagine then, back in 1895-ish, that was a completely revolutionary idea, right? People say, oh, you're, you're insane, right? How would you, how would you take, say, you know, 5,000 people to learn a, a country like, you know, United States, like 300 million? That, that's just impossible, right? So the idea took about 50 years, really half a century, to eventually sort of sank in, right? And, and uh, the person really made it sort of uh, become this really popular is that in 1945, when the United States, the, uh, um, this, uh, uh, the census, they, they actually uh, implement this, this sampling, uh, sampling idea. And from that point on, uh, because the data is there and people just sort of, you know, take that for, you know, for granted. Now, I always explain to people, uh, I try to explain people as part of my sort of, uh, uh, sort of pedagogical passions, like how do you explain to people on the street that how, how could you learn this much of something very vast by taking a very small sample. And uh, this is sort of uh, my, my Chinese background helps here because I love soups, we cook a lot of soups. And uh, so the example I give to people is think about anytime you are asked to taste uh, how salty or how delicious a soup is, no matter the size of the ball, whether it's small or big, all you have to do if you stir well, if you mix well, a, a tiny bit is all you need. Right, you don't. Like, and is, is this the is this the concept of representative sampling that if you if you get enough of that small bit, you you, you can kind of catch. 
like you're exactly right. So the idea of stir well, in, in general, you cannot stir people, mix people, but that's the idea of randomization, right? You do randomization, then you basically say, well, you know, that's pretty much homogeneous. The technical term is homogeneous, in which case I only need to take a very small part. And so that's a sort of that first, uh, you know, idea eventually kicking. Now, um, there are two parts that relate to this, and I can talk about both of them. The, um, the, the, the first is that, all the current statistical technique, pretty much all of them, all the probability theory, inference, all based on this idea is the data is mixed well enough. Mm. And the real problem is that in this natural population, particularly these days, you collect lots of data online or people self-report opinions. It's not a random sample. People have strong opinions tend to say more. And, uh, and I think one, one thing we have seen is really 2016 election. And that's you know an example, regardless of your ideology, regardless of who you want to vote for, we pretty much all get surprised in the end that all these surveys told us one direction, then it turned out to be the other way around, right? Mm -hmm. So one of my most recent work, the uh, article I published last year in the Annals of Applied Statistics is to show how small the data actually is if you take into account that the fact that it was not well mixed. Mm -hmm. So the calculation I've done using the real election uh, you know, from 2016, because once the result is out, we know the truth. You can see how much bias is there. You can back calculate. And the calculation I've done there is to show that if you had 1% uh, of the voting population give you opinion, that's about 2.3 million people. It's about like you know, a thousand survey each with, sorry, 2,200 surveys each with a thousand people. That seems a lot, right? But yeah. that Im amount of information, all data collected, because of the hidden bias, the way people report it, for whatever reason they report it in a biased way, that turned out to be the real data shows it's about equivalent to you have honest opinion from 400 people. Wow. That, that was the contract. It was, uh, mm -hmm. I had to recalculate that many times because everybody told me that like, you got to get this right. You basically said you, we lost all the data and that's the nature of the beast, right? So that's mm -hmm. the one thing about the data quality. But now get back to the question you asked, well, why do, what do I call as the second intellectually sort of violent revolution is the US Census Bureau has made announcement the next year, every 10 years you have these census, the 2020 census data, when they release them, they're not going to release what people believe is the original data. They will add noises to it, but they will add noises to pretty much all level except at the sort of the aggregate and, state. And, and is that to, to reduce and eliminate bias uh, or, or perceived bias in, in the data that they're receiving? No, that's a for a different purpose. That's a purpose is to, and I'm going to explain to you why they call it differential privacy. The idea is this is better to provide, to protect people's privacy. So this technique called the differential privacy, actually one of the leading uh, uh, inventor of the, the technique is uh, my colleague here, Cynthia Dork. And uh, uh, you can you know, easily find her. You should invite her to come to, to your yeah. Disrupt TV because I think that that is truly a disruptive uh, a force that is kind of coming. So the idea of differential privacy is quite simple in a sort of a, a lay, lay person's term. The idea is that, you know, whenever uh, Census Bureau, they, when they release data, they don't release individual data, obviously. They, they release aggregated data. Now, you think of the aggregate data should be safe. Well, not quite, right? If it's average of three people, you know, you can still tell something about you. If average of 300,000 people, that's a different story, right? But the thing is a little bit more complicated than that. Let's say we talk about average income. Let's say I have an average of 300,000 people now, if you take out any single individual, it's not going to change much, except if that person is Bill Gates, <laughs> right? Then you will see a big change. And from that, you will be able to tell there's something incredibly rich there. And you'll be able to statistically more likely to identify the person. So the whole idea of differential privacy, mathematical definition is saying, if I take out the one subject, it could be a person, it could be a, a census block. If you take out the one subject, Statistically, the answer do not change that much. Hmm. Now, how do you achieve that? The nature data sometimes may not have that. The idea is you infuse noise to your sum, right? If you infuse more noise to it, let's, let me put an extreme case. If I put down an incredibly large noise, you know, nothing matters, right? Because you, you won't be able to tell much. 
But the problem is if I in inject that much noise, my data will be useless, hmm. right? And so here is that a trade-off between the utility, the information in the data, and the privacy you want to protect. Is, and, so Dr. Man, is, is it very, uh, it's so interesting what you're saying right here. And, and uh, I, I can see how you're gonna protect the privacy of those who are uh, contributing data, especially when their answers may uh, help identify them. Uh, but you can, you can argue that in the 2016 election, that maybe some people didn't want to offer up. They didn't feel comfortable providing the or truthful answer on who, which candidate they were going to vote for. Right? They, they felt that maybe certain answers might may be more socially acceptable than others, and they may have told the pollsters what they wanted to hear. Does, does differential privacy help in that situation make people more willing to divulge their, their, the, the true data, that, uh, you know, the, what they're actually thinking and feeling? Well, that's a, that's a really great uh, a question. It actually has really have two parts of the answer to it. Let me answer the one you are asking. And I've also <laughs> digressed a little bit about the 2016, what we know so far based on the data analysis. Um, you're right. The part of a reason to provide data privacy, by the way, that's also required by the law. Just like the constitution mandates the censors every 10 years, the, the law also requires you have to protect individual private, uh, citizen privacy for obvious good reason. But there's also a te technical reason. It's exactly what you uh, mentioned, that if you don't provide enough confidence in terms of uh, 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 privacy, people tend to just either refuse to give you an answer or give you the misleading answer, which is the worst. Mm -hmm. One is to the refuse to give you answer is still a little bit easier to answer, to handle, than people deliberately give you the wrong answer. So there's not, there's not much you can do unless you know these are people likely going to give you the wrong answer. So yes, the part of the reason that you want to defend privacy, even the law does not require, you want, to, you want to do what is you want, because you want to always increase the response rate, right? Mm -hmm. The more people respond, the, the more information. But not only that, the part of the reason you want to increase response rate is also you want to increase the quality of the data, because you want them to, to answer correctly. So for both purpose, you want people to feel like they will not be identified. So they're more likely going to tell you what they on their mind. Right now, back to the 2016, and those are cases where yes, there's you know for reasons that we all understand, there are certain answers are not being viewed as a favorable or, or acceptable. So people tend to not want to respond. But I want to just say that the analysis we have done uh, point to there was quite a bit of belief that you know there are two scenarios: people lied, or yep. people refused to give give answer. But what I can tell you based on the analysis we have done is most like the more, it seems like the lie was a less likely scenario. People just refuse to give you answer, which is, you know, you can't say them lie. They just say, well, I have not decided. I'm still thinking about, probably it's true for, mo for most people. So that's the kind of evidence we, uh, we, we have. But, you know, the, this defense of privacy was really not just about, it's not just about election. This is really about the government statistics. How do you make it? Uh, so to hear the really complicated question, right? By provide defense of privacy, you may increase the number of people respond and respond correctly. So that's good for accumulating more information. Sure. But by injecting noise, you actually reduce the amount of information. But there are two different kinds of errors here. The way they inject noise is doing in statistical term is called unbiased noise in the sense that on average, they will be averaged out. And the kind of a, a, a problems like people self-report, they tend to bias the results because they tend to be a certain segment of the society or certain opinions. So there's this, uh, the statistic, in statistic term, there are two different terms. One is called a bias, which is kind of deliberate systematic error. The other is called a noise or called a variance. And that is the kind of a statistical errors you hope that on average, they get, you know, uh, sort of every job. Sure. You wrote that uh, the, the big data paradox, if you do not pay attention to data quality, then the, the bigger the data, the surer we fool ourselves. Yes. Uh, I remember the day of the election, New York Times had 96% likelihood that the Democratic candidate was going to win the presidency the day of the election. And the lessons learned in the 2016, the first one was what matters most is quality, not the quantity. And yeah. then lesson two was don't ignore seemingly tiny probabilistic data sets when combining data sources. Can you talk yeah. about that second lesson? Yes, but, you know, very much so. So I used the 2016 uh, uh, this uh, election as, as a good example to illustrate both points, right? Because you see, if I have data, let's say one point, I have two sorts of data. One has 2.3 million people in it. 
The other has say 400 people in it. Most current analysis, no matter what you do it, the answer from the 400 will be completely wiped out. As you know, whatever, whatever you do, that's obvious, right? And then most people say, well, why should I even pay attention to the 400? My point is that when you weight them, you shouldn't just weight by size. You should weight by the, what I call the effective sample, sample size, meaning the size take into account the quality, right? So the analysis I've done is, is, is to show using the real data, that 2.3 million answer, their statistical quality, the statistical error, I can show mathematically, it's equivalent to 400, point, uh, 400 people, but answered honestly, and, and that survey was well done, right? So the quality matters a lot more. So the thing, what I try to propose there is this concept called the, uh, the data defect index, because it's a much easier to measure the quantity of the data. Right, you just count how many people yeah. there. It's much harder to measure the quality of the data. The hardest part of measure quality of data is the quality depends on which question you are answering, because you know for different you have a data set that could have very high quality for answering one type of uh, a province, but it become useless for answer a different type. So that so, just gets so a, relative size versus absolute size matters. Right, because the because the the reason why it's so dramatic because like 2.3 will go down with 400, because once you don't mix well, the size of the container matters. And then basically the mathematical series shows the larger the, the size of container, the more error you're gonna have. Wow. Therefore, it's gonna reduce your effective sample size. And what does this tell you about the upcoming election? Have you, uh, how can <laughs> Yes, I do have, by the way, I actually have a soon enough. <laughs> yes, I do have a serious uh, insight, suggestion, to anyone who's doing the pool, uh, doing doing these uh, these pooling, is that that study basically shows that once you don't mix well, it's the size of your population matters, which means that you should pay more attention to these large states than the smaller ones. So basically, if you look at my paper, I will show that the 2016 these predictions that if you look at these so-called in you know, a confidence interval, which is a plus minus two error that kind of interval, they don't do too badly for very small states like uh, Rhode Island, because they do cover it. But the problem is with, by the time you get to these large states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, all these matters, then the arrows, they, they answer completely outside the bar because the arrows become much larger. But the ones you don't mix well, there's this technical term called data defect index. And that thing, essentially the error is that quantity multiplied by the square root of the voters turnout. So the more voters turn out. We'll have to write that one down. Yeah, Dion, we need an illustration. You yes, know, uh, there we go. <laughs> the diagram is coming. Of this right. algorithm, yes. Right. So, so that is sort of against the, 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 the traditional statistical insight is always like, you should worry about the smaller ones because they tend to vary more. But that's the kind of statistical noise when you have small, they're very small. But that kind of systematic bias that actually gets confirmed. The larger the population, the more it will confirm that kind of error. So you can count mm -hmm. on that you're gonna have a large error. So my, my a real insight there is that you should make a more adjustment for these kind of large states. So I would be much more worried if the large state tells me like, the answer is so precise, I say, wait a minute, you might just be confirmed a bias. So for, for, for the lay person, you know, uh, uh, when they hear this, it sounds like the data is being manipulated. And the, the key, if I'm understanding everything that you're saying is that we have to have trust in the system and the process of this data gathering so that we're getting the right data from people. Yeah. Uh, how does that work? And can, can you talk a little bit about reliability versus relevance and statistical evidence? Sure, that's an absolutely great, great question. But I want to answer first that whoever thinks the data being manipulated, you have to rely, realize the manipulation, if we talk about these election pools, are done by everyone, by everyone who answered the question, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like anybody intentionally at the processing stage is because people choose to not to answer or people to choose answer by its way. So the well, they're problem, manipulating the data too, right, exactly. It's, it's all, all of us. I mean, you know, government agents, they are doing their job. They're trying to do, they're trying to present the data as honestly as possible as the way they do. But the problem is, I think you previously mentioned, it's like garbage in, garbage out, mm -hmm. right? If there's something that buys fundamentally, now the government actually have to correct them. And that usually is not easy. You need to make, Correction itself takes a lot of assumption. These assumptions can be wrong. You know, then the theory comes in, 
like uh, talk about election, you may be thinking about, okay, let's go back to 2012, even go f further back to use this data to predict, you know, get more evidence. But then you run into another question problem here is the you know, election changes so dramatic from one to another, you know, data is relevant in the past 20 years, so may or may not be relevant for the future, right? So there's all, the, all these caveats that, that, that you need to take into account. So the fundamentally that it's, it's a kind of work that uh, um, in a way I always say, doing a statistical work or other similar work is like a detective job, right? You're trying to figure out what evidence pre present to you are the sort of crucial real evidence. What are the evidence are sort of circumstantial, may or may not relevant, or what are the evidence may be all planned there to, to mislead you, right? So that's always, uh, always a very hard one. And uh, the, the bottom line is that data quality is absolutely crucial. And I think that the previous uh, 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 speaker was absolutely right that uh, the data cleaning itself is incredibly important and usually spend 80% and 90% of the time. But I also want to mention that data cleaning, most people think about there's sort of, there's a way to clean the data and that's not easy at all, right? Because you need to know what the data will be used for. And there's no golden standard you know how to clean the data. Because if we know how to clean the data, we probably have a lot more information uh, already that we don't need to collect that much data. So it's, it's a kind of iterative process, which the good news is for all of us that we always have a job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, lots of work to do. <laughs> Dr. Shalom, I mean, thank you so much for your fantastic insights. We hope you come back again. We could have spent an hour speaking with you. Thank you very Absolutely. much. I have, a lot more, I have a lot more started to tell about individualized medicine, all the other stuff, which is, you know, that's what has keep us so busy these days. Fantastic. Well, we, we definitely welcome you back. And uh, thank you again for coming on the Shrop TV. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, that was fascinating. That was fascinating. Oh, yeah. Well, data is the, the new oil, as they say, or I've heard it's called the new uranium now, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you heard that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's the, we have our final guest. This is our uh, cleanup hitter spot. And we're, uh, uh, it's a privilege for us to have John Reed, who's the co founder of Digenomica, which examines the digital enterprise from vantage point of real world use cases. Uh, as a roving blogger analyst, John frequently writes and video casts on enterprise trends. Uh, he's one of our favorite guests on Disrupt TV, a must follow on Twitter at John ERP, J O N E R P. Welcome back, John, to Disrupt TV. <laughs> Hey guys, <laughs> we're gonna get it. Last two guests, and and uh, and I want your 2020 election uh, prediction. <laughs> oh geez. Yeah, yeah, no. um, Go there. I really want to avoid the dystopian side of this, uh, <laughs> but um, actually, it's funny because I was thinking two things about your first, your last two guests. First of all, I can't wait to see Dion's graphic trying to <laughs> illustrate. The point. Yeah, I've never put a math formula in my graphic, so we'll have to see how that turns out. The square <laughs> root of, uh, of uh, voter contribution. <laughs> yeah. Then I was thinking your job just got easier because you're done talking to the really smart people. Um, but the the third thing is simply that, like, if we had those kinds of conversations throughout the fall, this is going to be a really great uh, fall event season because I thought those conversations really got to the heart of why data matters, but also what the obstacles are. And I, I love that. Um, you know, I, I think the only thing I would kind of quickly add is I think in the enterprise context, the data quality issue is huge, but it's also a data silo issue. Right. So I think that may be a little bit of a distinction between when you're researching this, you put all your data in one place, then you try to clean it, have fun with that in the enterprise. Um, yeah, the last yeah, sentence that Dr. Mon said is there's no standardization in terms of data cleanup. So, you know, yeah. what framework you apply, um, will, you know, will matter. You know, we're, in the, we're in the cave painting days of, of all of this, right? So we're still learning, you know, and setting standards and expectations. We never had all of this before, right? And so uh, data science is new, but uh, what we're doing with it is and how we're doing it. Yeah, and I think elections are, the elections are a really great example of how humans and machines, can we work together to reinforce trust uh, in the outcome, or is it going to create more distrust, right? Because that's, that's a huge concern, I think, coming up regardless of who you want to win or whatever. Like, can we look back on this as a milestone in data integrity? Are we going to look back at this as another kind of cock up around what happened to our election? And, you know, I don't think we know yet. So there's a bit of suspense there. Yeah. 
Well, you know, I think you know, sunlight's the best des disinfectant, and you know, the it, we talk about transparency and explainability in these processes, but most people can't actually follow them. You can provide the raw data, the the the, the unbiased data that you removed the bias from, and then the algorithms and how you did that. But most people can't follow along, and and this is going to be the the challenge in establishing trust in, in any of this. And this is why I was saying that I think the feedback loop is. We'll see it when the answers come back from these systems correctly, and we begin to rebuild trust in them. I think that, you know that's that's going to be a challenge of our time. So, uh, John, so I normally run into you, uh, at, uh, probably see you probably 10, 20 times a year, hunched over a computer in the press analyst room at some uh, in, yeah, yeah. in the dungeon of some conference. Thanks for um, that. And you and I <laughs> see uh, a lot of the things that are happening. We hear a lot of the stories. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're thinking in terms of tech trends, uh, especially enterprise tech trends this year? Yeah, well, you guys, you guys can play along with this because you may have some observations here. But what I did is I kind of gamified the fall event season for everyone here, uh, okay. complete, complete with sound effects. Um, so what I did is I, I, uh, I picked about eight uh, trends uh, that I think I'm going to be looking out for. And, and each one has a little bit of a pattern, which is when, when a, a vendor says something, what question should you be asking about it? So we're going to start with 5G. So... When, when a vendor says 5G changes everything with ubiquitous broadband, you say, and I'll, I'll show you what I say in this case, or what I recommend we all ask, what are the use cases? Oh. So in other words, we, we're going to hear a lot about 5G, I think, this fall. Yeah, what are you going to do with it? Right, exactly. Right. And, and so what gets interesting is looking at, at, at each industry specifically. And I just did a 5G retail thing. And one of the cool things that came out is that in reality, maybe 5G is more of an evolution than a revolution in that some of these things are possible on 4G. And you know, so instead of getting hung up on this super expensive infrastructure rollout, what are some things you can start doing now? And some of the interesting things that had not occurred to me, for example, in retail are the power of, of 5G type connections enabling the kind of pop-up shop phenomena, right? Where you don't have time to roll out a wired infrastructure. Um, but, but now with, with a superior broadband, you can. So, so, so vendors might get you excited about things like tele, telemedicine, which kind of gets a little scary when I think about like remote surgery, for example, um, where someone's telling you. <laughs> oh, but, it, but it's so low latency, John, it's gotta be safe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I was thinking, yeah, if you're maybe if you're like stuck in the mountains and you know and you need help with some amputation, it could come in handy. But hopefully, it will never come to that, right? But but then, like on a much more practical level, he's talking about how um, retailers spend a ton of money going to job fairs and the ability to do more high quality remote interviews uh, mm -hmm. using better broadband connections. Okay, it's not a real glamorous use case, but it is a use case. Um, and then and then of course, along with that is sort of the dark side of it, right? So. All, all of these trends we're talking about have a dark side that we have to make transparent and discuss. In the case of 5G, I would say facial recognition, which is not to say that everything about facial recognition is dark. Um, there could be opportunities for retailers, for example, to if you, if you allow a retailer, if you say, hey, I don't mind if you recognize me when I'm in your store and provide me with an offer, that's yeah. great. But what happens the first time you didn't opt into that and a retailer pings you and says, Hey, Vala, <laughs> you walked right by the $500 wireless headsets, dude. <laughs> Dr. Dre, well, baby. This chin strap makes me very recognizable. So <laughs> I've been strong algorithms to know I'm in the store. But no, you right. talked about, in the article, you talked about re remote subject matter experts being able to provide guidance uh, on products and services. You talked about surveillance, security, facial recognition, all in the spirit of personalization. So there was a number of use cases in the retail sector. And I look forward to more articles from you covering other sectors because even though they weren't, sec like you said, sexy use cases, they're actually helpful, useful use cases. Right. You know, I would like to be able to, in near real time, engage with a SME when I'm shopping, especially, you know, if, if, if you know, when today you may not have access to an expert in store. Uh, and, and so that virtual well, yeah well and it sounds like John these are the, the accessible near-term use cases because until you know we get those trillion femto cell you know uh, nodes out there to, uh, to actually communicate to this we're not going to have retailers putting a transmitter into every box that they have in the store so you can find it quickly with your phone which that's my dream I hate going to the supermarket because you know, I don't go often enough to remember where anything right. is right but I wish these things could tell me but you know 5g is going to make that happen but not not in 2020 right Right. Okay. On to number two. 
So when vendors say, move your data to the cloud, you say, what about cloud security? How about multi-cloud? Uh, <laughs> yeah, or you can ask about multi-cloud very much. Yeah, be, feel free to throw your suggestions out if you have a good one there. Um, so uh, I think the real takeaway here is obviously security is nothing new in the cloud, but the cloud security conversation is changing. The Capital One uh, brouhaha uh, brought out some really interesting points because what people are starting to realize is, yeah, uh, cloud providers like AWS may have excellent security, but it takes real IT sophistication to provide ironclad cloud security, and that includes on your side as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and cloud providers, I think, are going to experience more pressure to meet that halfway than, than they have in the past where they've kind of said, okay, the tools are there. You just have to kind of activate the right tools and, and I'm wondering, I don't know if regulation is going to do it. I'm not sure our regulators are going to get sufficiently involved. But I did an interesting thing on this, looking at server-side request forgeries and how uh, AWS could do more to address this shortcoming uh, by including extra identifying information. And Google's already done that. And that kind of caught my eye because I was thinking, are the cloud providers going to start competing around security features? And that would be a very healthy trend. So... That's kind of my point around cloud security. It's always been an issue, but I think the conversation is sharpening quite a bit in terms of who's responsible. Agreed. Oh, I think we have a interruption. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a buzzword alert for um, look out for DevSecOps. Uh, Where's the AI ops? It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> just, just hold on. Uh, so anyway, I just, just watch out for the fancy buzzwords. But the idea is that security's got to be embedded in everything. The, the, the theme this fall for buzzwords is that you're operationalizing your buzzwords. So everything uh, is ops. Everything's so, ops. So totally. Everything yeah. is ops. Right. 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 So okay. So does the last one relate to, or how does it relate to the the recent post you wrote about agile versus low code debate? When you talk about security and DevOps, and you have citizen developers, and you have Agile, which you know introduces a whole other set of complexities and issues to debate and discuss. Talk about that a bit. Right, well, we, we sparked our debate on Diginomica with an article that was a little, let's face, a little link baity on this notion that Agile was dead. And um, so yeah. I kind of <laughs> try to take control of that debate a little bit and kind of put out, we put out some different perspectives on it. and. There's no simple answers here, except that, you know, we are, I always encourage customers not to be religious about anything, whether it's low code or agile or anything, that everything has its place, right? I always said, I said in one of the pieces, the next big thing isn't, but it can still help you. And, and I think what, what companies are really trying to do here is a couple things. They're trying to empower business users uh, to, to get more done without the help of developers when they don't need it. And there's just not a, there's not enough developers to, to meet demand anymore. I mean, and there's not enough computer science graduates. We, we need to right. Yeah. There, there you go. And you can imagine a lot of simple applications business users could create using low code environments where they don't need any help from developers. And that's a great thing. Um, then on the other hand, what, what to me at the heart of agile is really about that, that we need to be building software in close communication with our constituents and stakeholders that care about that software. So this idea of like burying your head in, 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 in the code for a year and coming out and saying, how do you like it? It's a total fail. And so, and so to me, the concept of agile is about how you do that better, but it's not going to work for everything and it's not a cure all. And that was, that was kind of what, what the debate sparked was this thing around, you can get into trouble with agile as well, because agile is often ideal for much smaller projects and smaller groups when you have big things big projects that can be taught. So there's a huge sort of debate around that and there's no right answers, but I think it's a healthy discussion. Sure. So, so it's agile ops and low code ops, got it. Agile yeah. ops and low code ops are, are coming near you. Um, when a vendor says our growth rates are double digit year over year, you say, you must be what about Brexit? Uh, so, sorry, Vala, what was yours? Well, no, no, you must be Salesforce. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I can't comment on, on an organization. You might, either, be very, you might be very familiar with. But um, no, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we could have a large macro macroeconomic conversation. And, but, but the point is, there's so much going on in the macro economy right now that affects everything that I think. Just today, down, to, down 450 before I logged on. So, yeah. The yeah. Macro. We, we need to pay attention to that. And I think, I think where vendors can, you might say, well, okay, well, how can we really like deal with that in a technology conference? What I would say is like, 
how are you helping your customers with what if scenarios and thinking through how their si supply chains might need to change very quickly based on, for example, the escalating trade war with China, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So um, in fact, your own Ray Wong uh, has a relevant piece on Constellation I recommend on digital duopolies, which looks at some of these mm -hmm. issues and the role of big okay. tech. And so to me, it's all about just realizing that the, that the growth rates are great, but, but there's a bigger conversation we have to have. So, okay. When, uh, when a vendor says, we'll help you change your customer experience, you say, hold on to your wallet. There, well, okay, that's a good one. You say, how are you changing your own customer experience? Absolutely. And, uh, well, and, you, and, wrote, you recently wrote that I, undivided attention is a fantasy, especially in the B2B content yeah. creators. Uh, and this yeah, yeah. experience is overhyped. So tell me about that. <laughs> Well, yeah, that was kind of a response to some posts around, um, in, in fact, uh, a great podcast series that is somewhat connected to uh, Salesforce uh, called Electronic uh, Propaganda Society, which I was kind of riffing on and critiquing. And this idea, it was kind of this idea of contextual experiences. And I was asking, like, what the heck are contextual experiences? And what does that really mean? Uh, and, and that was kind of a riff. But, but part of it was just this notion that, that we're not able necessarily to... Uh, to really capture anyone's undivided attention. And I think the notion that we can create B2B content that does that is kind of a fantasy, but, but it was kind of stepping back from that and saying, well, how do we provide value to, 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 the, to our constituents and how do, essentially how do we build communities around our products? And, and, and that ties into this customer experience thing we were just talking about because some of the vendors that push customer experience the hardest are also very tough in their contract negotiations. Mm. Their, their support is not always up to snuff. Um, and uh, Brian Summer, I just edited a piece he wrote for us called Wrote Me In, Tie Me Up, SAS Age Vendor Lock-In is here. And, and, and the underlying point with all of this is, is simply that we're all on this journey of changing our businesses together. And I think it's fair to ask vendors, customer experience vendors included, you know, about their overall customer experience they're providing and also just their journey. Because look, these things aren't easy. If it was easy to provide great support, we'd all be doing it, you know? So uh, anyway, it's just a, a provocative question, I think. And do you, do you qualify that by asking them about customer retention, net promoter score, you know, uh, right. uh, cost, acquisition cost? Uh, you know, how, how, what evidence do you look at to ensure that when a customer companies talking about a customer experience led economy that they're also drinking their own champagne or eating. Yeah. Food. Well, those are really great questions. And, and I don't think we've figured out all the metrics yet for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of an ongoing journey. Um, but, but to your point, absolutely. Things like, how are you guys dealing with your own churn? Mm -hmm. How are you dealing with retention? You know, how do you think about things like customer lifetime value? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, all those things are so important now because we spend so much time getting customers and then we, then we're, then we're losing them. And so we have to, we're kind of challenging ourselves there, I think, to have a consistency and the discussion around metrics is ongoing, but you're, you're exactly right. You, you might net promoter score might be something of a flawed metric, but it doesn't hurt to ask about it either. Sure. So, yeah, Oh, I think we have a buzzword alert. Uh, yeah. Uh, AI. Oh, yeah, you do have it. Okay, good. Yeah. 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 Get, get ready for a, some AI ops this fall. Okay, I want to blast through a couple more because we're almost out of time here. Yeah. Um, when companies say we are data driven, you say, show me the results. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all based on a question I've been asking for a few years, which is, shouldn't companies that are ahead in the data and analytics game be showing outsized market results? Mm. And I, you could pose the same question for digital transformation. And most of the really good examples I see of this are really more with smaller companies that went cloud first or smaller divisions of companies that were given some room to work on these things. But I think these are really important questions. And what is exciting actually is looking at how companies are beginning to roll out subscriptions and as a service business models and, and, and kind of get on top of their analytics to identify new opportunities. But I would just say that we're still kind of early on in that game. And so that's kind of a lot of times what I'm looking for is what is the ROI of this? And yeah. even if even if the answers there aren't perfect, it's still worth looking at. Like you guys in in your uh, Supernova Awards, I recommend that the people watching this take a look at some of the finalists this year because some of them have some pretty interesting use cases where they address some of those questions. 
like in the data decisions category where I'm, I'm often a judge. I was a judge in different category this year, but there's a good one on Pearson and how they did 20% target improvements in lifetime value based on some of the stuff they did. But these are the things we're trying to get a handle on is, is how, how these changes lead to results. Well, and, and I would say, John, there are two, two quick things. One is uh, I don't see that a analytics is democratized enough. So it's not going to drive these huge bottom line enterprise wide right. changes yet uh, because not enough people have the tools or the skills. And the other piece is that ops component. We just don't have enough ability to actually feel this. Even if we gave the tools to everybody, we, we don't have a way of actually operationalizing it anyhow. So is, is there a line of business? Like when you get the, what are the results? Are you mostly getting them from chief revenue, chief information, the customer service, or, 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 or maybe even a CMO, who, who actually is best suited to show you results? Well, uh, your, your employer Salesforce has done some really good stuff on, on quantifying this for retailers. And a lot of it, a lot of the results I'm seeing, especially around things like AI and personalization are, are tied to customer facing stuff like e-commerce. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think you're starting to see a little more on the service side, but especially with personalized commerce, you're starting to see results, customer facing initiatives. But obviously we wanna start seeing the same type, type of results with finance, uh, with, with supply chain managers and stuff like that. So uh, over time, I think we will. Um, anyhow, we're out of time, but I do wanna just throw in a couple of very quickies, which is when they say our keynote is three hours long, you say, <laughs> really? good, I need to catch up with my email. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I, I wonder who's going to break the keynote record uh, this fall for longest keynote uh, in any, I, I won't say the word Dreamforce. Um, I'm sure that'll be concise keynotes. Uh, yes. And when they say, are you ready for quantum computing? You say, get back to me next year. <laughs> uh, oh, and, and, and just to show that I haven't slept on this, I do have quantum ops. So quantum I'm, ops. I'm ready for quantum ops. Quantum ops, nice. I can't believe uh, you don't have blockchain ops, but but you know, well, come back to me next oh, week. I'm sure yeah. you can make it in about the next 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I can make one, but I do have snark ops, snark ops, which is what I, which is what I'm using to, to counter some of these things. But anyway, so, uh, so I appreciate you having me. It's always fun. Look forward to seeing you guys this fall. It should be a blast. Absolutely. You always produce the fastest 20 minutes segment on Disrupt, one of our favorite, favorite guests. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us, John. My pleasure, guys. Have a great day. Thanks, John. Dion, now you see why Ray and I, you know, why Friday is our favorite time of the week. And uh, Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, it was always great guests. And so the show's fantastic. But yeah, John's, uh, he, he's a special one. He is. He's tremendous. Uh, next week is episode 161. We have Deepak Padaki, Infosys Chief Strategy Officer as our first guest. We have Tina Moran, Senior Deputy Chief Health Officer and Chief Pharmacy Officer at IBM Watson Health. And one of our, our favorite uh, guests are returning, David Chow, Vice President, Principal Analyst, Constellation Research, one of the you know, incredible CIOs in the healthcare industry who's now part of the Constellation family. So thank you, Dion. Again, uh, you know, Ray and I know exactly who to go to when, when we're not here on a Friday, you were terrific. Thanks so much, Paul. You did, you did fantastic today. Thank you. Looking very forward. Much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you uh, next week. Bye, everyone.